Very good, thank you. It's my great pleasure and honor to be introduced by my friend Daddy. And, <laughs> and um, um, the first part of the talk is just going to be reading the names of all the people that, uh, <laughs> that we've collaborated with over the years. And this is just uh, the collaborators on the last part, but I'll be using uh, things on the collaborators from, <laughs> from many, many, uh, for the past decade. So uh, thank you to, uh, to everyone. Um, so now let's read the names. So um, the uh, things that I'll be talking about are the following things. I'm going to talk about how to uh, catalog, try to catalog some of the flat bands, exact flat bands that one can obtain um, theoretically. And then um, I'm going to present a way to, to build flat bands, um, which I claim on a lattice and without particle hole symmetry is generic. Um, I'm going to talk about um, how to find these flat bands in through uh, through you know geometric and um, and brute force methods uh, on materials catalogs, and then I'm going to present a series of kind of made up, very artificial uh, models, but that have the uh, property that they're almost exactly solvable with interactions. And uh, I'm going to basically argue that topology is important for the stiffness of the, of the uh, um, many-body modes, you know, Cooper pairs, uh, for example, or uh, Goldstones in flat bands, and that in flat bands, basically, you don't have anything else besides quantum geometry and or topology. Topology bounds quantum geometry, but um, quantum geometry doesn't imply topology. Um, but b quantum geometry is basically necessary for a stiffness of um, the collective modes in interacting flat bands. And um, we're going to give some examples of of these models that are almost exactly solvable. Actually, I don't really know that if they're not really exactly solvable. Certainly, they're exactly solvable for the um, small number of excitations, manifolds. Um, and then we're going to try to go to twisted bilayer graphene and try to apply these, what we've learned here, to twisted bilayer graphene, which is different. It's a continuum model. Um, um, I wasn't here because I was traveling, but probably Adi talk about, talked about continuum uh, flat bands. Uh, you didn't, OK. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, so then, uh, then uh, this part of the talk might be a bit awkward, but <laughs> but um, but yes, yeah, actually, <laughs> you said we're near the end of the near is a very relative uh, term. Okay. So uh, why are flat bands interesting? Uh, now, hopefully, after this school where certain numbers of flat bands and were introduced, I don't need to um, argue this more, but basically um, in the, you know, 2010, it was basically uh, proposed that um, the flat bands offer kind of an attractive pathway for getting strongly correlated matter and especially getting superconductivity with high temperature. Because in a flat band, basically, Hay, Hay Killa and Volovic showed that the superconducting temperature, and this, by this they actually mean the gap, not uh, you can still have kind of uh, zero superfluid weight, is proportional to the interaction rather than having the BCS form of an exponential of 1 over the density of states times the interaction. So it's a completely different, different, um, different scaling. Um, now, flat bands were known way before to kind of give interesting interacting physics. They give ferromagnetic um, 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 states kind of by default, and I'll show very easily why in repulsive models they give uh, with, with spin. It's very natural to get ferromagnetic states with flat bands. Uh, but then there's also work on Wigner crystallization superfluid uh, formation. Now, the role of topology in the flat bands was actually started by the seminal paper of uh, Pai Vitorma and, and other people, where they showed that a churn number band, a churn number non-zero band kind of has, uh, if you induce superconductivity, in it, um, the superfluid weight is bounded by the quantum metric. Now, that turns out to not be 100% true. It's bounded by 
the minimal quantum metric, which was something that, that um, uh, was kind of revisited this year. Uh, but um, if you've got topology, the minimal quantum metric is itself bounded by the churn number. Okay? So the bound is, um, is, is solid. And um, in fact, you don't even need a churn number. For example, in twisted bilayer graphene, you've got a different type of topology, not with churn number, but it also bounds the superfluid weight, which is very necessary because if you, didn't, if you just had a flat band coming from um, orbitals that are atomic, that are kind of localized, you couldn't obviously get super, you couldn't get no hopping between orbitals, so you couldn't get supergravitivity there or any other interesting um, interacting states that involve hopping. So the flat bands that we'll be talking about um, are the ones to the right. We're not very interested in flat atomic bands, which are, come from basically having, you know, levels of electrons that are localized on the atoms, and if this localization, for example, if I can build a Vania state, or a, 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 um, um, I can describe the band in terms of states that are kind of localized where the atoms are, then um, the hopping, and very localized, by which I mean you know, less than, say, 0.2 the unit cell, then because you have exponential decay, um, the hopping between this and this will be effectively zero, and you'd get to no, um, no dispersion. Now, these flat bands are... Um, not what we're interested in. What we're interested in is flat bands that come from having hopping. So you have, you have prob you know, high probability, or non-zero and um, non-vanishing probability of the electrons kind of moving around between lattice sites, uh, um, or hopping around between different orbitals. Uh, but yet you still have a flat band. So those, these flat bands can only come from quantum interference. And um, the kind of canonical example is the Kagome lattice. In the Kagome lattice, I don't have time to do the, uh, the actual real space description, but in the Kagome lattice, you have kind of a, you know, a graphene-like spectrum, but then you have an exact flat band if you only have nearest neighbor um, that's got a degeneracy point here and here. Even though the hoppings are, um, you know, can be very large, it's this irrespective of the hoppings. The hoppings are basically just give you the um, uh, bandwidth. And the band is exactly flat if you've got exact nearest neighbors. Now, you know, if you introduce next nearest neighbors, you can put, you can, you can get to um, certain ratios of next nearest neighbors, etc. that the band still stay flat. Yes. So, uh, if, if you were to gap that flat band, and then try to vanilize that, wouldn't you get uh, yeah. very localized states in the... Very good. I'll talk about this in... The, well, when do I talk about this? Hang on. I'll talk about this in two slides, hopefully. Two slides, so just hold. Okay, thanks. You can't vanilize the band, even if you open a gap. So, and that's, that's kind of to the point of very good question. Just hang on for two slides. Okay, so the other example is twisted bilayer, which has a Wilson loop. And Wilson loop is just the Berry phase, the Berry phase in one direction, plotted as a function of the momentum in the other direction. In twisted bilayer, we have two bands per some quantum numbers called valley and spin. And the Wilson loop basically me measures the Vanya center, the position of the Vanya center. And you know, if I had something that's localized on the atoms, the Vanya center doesn't move; it's localized here. And if I plot it in the 2D lattice, okay, the Vanya center sits here, here. I Fourier transform with this momentum, the Vanya center is still on the lattice and doesn't change with this momentum. So if I had, if I was to plot the Vanya center in for two bands, I would have, you know, if one Vanya center sits at position A1 in the lattice and the other in A2, they would kind of not move. But in twisted bilayer, they kind of cross and wind, which is a reflection of the fact that these bands are topological and you can't, you can't vanilize them again, even though they are uh, flat. So we like to talk about bands with large hopping. Now, uh, this, of course, implies you know, that the bands are either, um, either come from uh, materials with large orbital overlap uh, or from continuum models such as the twisted bilayer. Okay, now, to show you that 
actually these bands actually exist even in stoichiometric materials. Here's an experiment. Actually, this material showed up in earlier. Is there a pointer, actually? No? There was, but some... <laughs> but, but there's the... Oh, okay. But Adi took it. <laughs> okay, so thank you. So you can see that there's a very flat band at the Fermi level here, okay, in this material. This material actually exists, you know, in, in this database that we've made of flat band materials, but it, was actually sh it actually showed up two weeks before we published the database in this Chelkelsky group uh, experiment, so they, were, or they already kind of, kind of uh, knew about it, but there's, of course, in the same um, 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 list of compounds, there's many others with also flat bands. And these bands basically come from the geometry of the lattice. Something looks like Kagome there. But you can also see that there's a lot of other stuff around it. There's a lot of other dispersive bands around it. So, you know, in effect, when you want to build a catalog of clean materials, you don't want all these other junk around it unless it's, you know, there for um, um, also a reason. So we'll try to get better materials than this with more um, um, clean flat bands. Okay, so now um, we're going to come to the slide with Inigo's question. What, what are the things that are known in the literature about flat bands? Well, there's quite a few things known about flat bands in the literature, and this was a slide that I made uh, last year, so right now there's even uh, more things, uh, especially in continuum models, but these are on the lattice. So on the lattice is known that you cannot get exact flat bands, and exact I don't mean exponentially, I don't mean bandwidth that's exponentially vanishing, I mean exact flat bands that have churn numbers with finite range hopping. And uh, the conjecture that you know, I cannot prove but I strongly believe is true, is that no stable topological state can uh, be obtained on the lattice to be exactly, to, be, to have exactly flat bands with finite range hopping or with a finite number of bands. Okay? So that's the first thing that's known. In the Kagome lattice, uh, Bergman, Wu, and Balance built, this is the flat band of the Kagome lattice, built um, an overcomplete, ex uh, an overcomplete localized um, um, basis, actually. So this is localized, not extended. So the <laughs> localized basis on, on the lattice um, uh, here. But there were two, two extended states. And they attributed this extended state to this degeneracy point, to the fact that it's a metal. In fact, you can kind of attribute them to either of the bands if you do what uh, uh, Inigo said, which is to gap this point. And what happens is that if you keep inversion symmetry, if you try to gap this point, there's two things that happen. First of all, the band stops being exactly flat, so you can gap it a little bit and make it quasi-flat. But remarkably, the thing that happens is that there's no way to gap this flat band into being trivial. Okay? So it's always a quantum spin hole state if you gap this band with spin orbit coupling, for example. So this flat band, when gapped, is always a quantum spin hole state. There's no path to triviality if you keep inversion symmetry. And hence, you cannot build Vanya states for it. You have to, or, or localize Vanya states for it. So you're always going to have some extended states. And this is actually these. Um, two extended states on, 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 on the lat on that is written down by, uh, by, uh, by uh, Bergman Wu and Balance. Then the Hau group basically was doing this for their optic, for their um, photonic um, experiments. They were basically generating a huge amount of, of models with flat bands. So, for example, look at this model with it's kind of you know complicated. But, you know, it's got a mess of bands, but there's a flat band here, okay? And this is how we basically got into this game of looking at flat bands. And, you know, we first ran some, you know, we, we knew that the, the, the Kagome, when you gap it, becomes topological. So we asked, you know, for these flat bands, let's do a Wilson loop and let's see what the Berry phase does. So there's actually two flat bands here, not just one. You just can't, can't see, you know, because they're on top of each other. There's two flat bands, and if you run the Wilson loop, you find that the Wilson loop winds. So again, this flat band cannot be vanierized. So rule of thumb, if the Wilson loop of the, or the Berry phase in one direction as you move the momentum in the other direction, so the non-abelian Berry phase, if you have two bands, you're going to get two eigenvalues of this non-abelian berry phase. If you have m bands, you're going to get m eigenvalues. And if they wind, you can't vanierize the state because the Wilson loop is the vanier center. 
and if the for for to be able to comp to exponentially localize states, you must have the Wilson loop kind of stay constant, right? Because if the states are exponentially localized, they'll stay constant as you move the momentum. But here, they wind, so you can't do it. And we did a lot of these um, uh, bands, um, the flat bands, and we, find that we found that most of them are topological, not all of them, but most of them are topological. So then we started asking if there's a deeper principle why flat bands should actually uh, naturally come out as topological when you have non-zero hopping, and it turns out that there is. Not all of them, but it's natural for them to be topological. So, I need to now do a small intermezzo and show you a little, a little, um, um, the, you know, basically the way to understand topology from eigenvalues, which we'll be using. So it turns out that there is a mapping from the orbitals on a lattice from all the, yes, The generically, yes. Generically, yes. Um, now, now, as I will show, this is the purpose of showing it, um, you know, you can, you can get by with less information. You can get by with only the information at high symmetry points, only the eigenvalues of the, of the bands at high symmetry points. But generically, you will need to run a Wilson loop. If, I, if you don't have any spatial symmetry, you're not going to get any eigenvalues. And, you know, quantum spin hole, for example, in symmetry group one, where you don't have any uh, spatial symmetry, you're going to need to run a Wilson. So that's a much harder, much more intensive computation than just computing the eigenvalues. But that's uh, a bulletproof statement that, that the bands are topological if the Wilson of points. Okay. Yes. Um, I was wondering about, so um, you said that there are also flat bands that have no topological origins. So for, the topolo for those with topological origin, I kind of see it. I, I kind of... Can, uh, uh, that implies already the argument, but what about those that have no topological origin? I mean, they could be even more, more interesting then, right? Because there's nothing in principle that, that pres uh, prescribes some sort of delocalization. Well, so, so, so I would say that, okay, so I would say that, you know, there's always flat bands by fine tuning, okay? So for example, the following system has flat bands. Okay, this is a molecular system, this is a dimerized system, okay? If I do it at t, this is plus minus t, flat bands, okay? So, so I would say, but this is basically in the, this is still in the um, first category of having a basically being completely localized, because this, instead of being a, you know, an atomic system, is literally a molecular system, okay? So, if now, however, you get flat bands by also having some T prime, which you don't, then, and those are trivial, then, uh, well, I'm not sure that those are more interesting or less interesting than topological ones, but you have a prescription on when do they become trivial and when, so this is what I'm going to show, that there's a prescription of when they're topological, when they're trivial. In 1D, there's nothing topological, so this is a red herring, but um, 2D and higher, um, and, and, and this prescription basically shows you that it's natural for them to be topological. Okay, so we're just going to have to wait a little bit to, to, get, to get this. Okay, the machinery that we need, and again, I'm going to give you just a flavor, is the following. If I, have, if I know all the orbitals in the system, okay, then I'm going to be able to tell you the eigenvalues of the bands at the high symmetry points. So, for example, in graphene, S or PZ orbitals always have these eigenvalues at the high symmetry points. So you don't necessarily know if M1 is above M4 or M4 is ab above M1. Okay, that depends on whether your hopping is positive or negative. Okay, but you know that all the orbitals in the system um, give, set a, give, give a set of bands that have these eigenvalues. Same thing with PX and PY orbitals. You have this um, uh, set of eigenvalues. And this statement is just representation, induction, and subduction. So what you do is, by construction, if I put orbitals, those are localized. So all the bands together up to the bandwidth have to be um, uh, trivial. I should be able to represent the entire set of bands by localized orbitals, because those are just the low-down functions, low-down orbitals of, you know, just the atomic orbitals of my, of my system. 
Then I put an orbital on a site, uh, repeating it on the whole lattice is a mathematical procedure called induction of this representation, an orbital is a representation really, to the full space group, and then you Fourier transform and you go into the Brillouin zone and you get the eigenvalues, okay? So let me show you why this procedure gives you both the atomic limits, or a basis for the atomic limits, and, and um, the topological bands, okay? So, let's take the simplest example. So this is just a simplest, the simplest example of, you can generalize this to every symmetry group, but we're not gonna do that, I just wanna give you a flavor of how to do it. Let's take two dimensions and the rectangular lattice with this unit cell, and the symmetry that I wanna impose is inversion, okay? So with inversion symmetry, it turns out that on the lattice, there are several positions which are special. This position, which is invariant under inversion, this position, which is invariant under inversion, times a translation in the x direction, and the other ones here and here, which are given there, okay? Now, these are called site symmetry groups. You don't need to remember that statement. Mathematically, they're the same group because they both square to one, so they're the same Z2 group. So now you can ask, what type of orbitals can I put here, okay? Um, so it turns out that, of course, I, as I said, orbitals are representations, and there's only two representations of inversion. There's the S orbital, and there's the P orbital, and PX, PY, PZ are the same. Okay, under this. This has eigenvalue plus one under inversion, and this has eigenvalue minus one. This is a scalar, this is a vector. Okay, so I can put either an S or a P orbital, or I can put two S or two P, or 25 S and three million P, okay, orbitals, if I want to, here. Okay, so this is what I can do here. Now, I said that now you want to Fourier transform it. You want to, now, if I Fourier transform this, since the group is invariant under inversion, times no lattice translation, you pick your origin of the system here. Had I picked it here, I would have had to, I would have, this one would have become non-trivial. When I Fourier transform, this picks up no phase because I don't have any translation. So in the Brillouin zone, these orbitals at the high symmetry points in the Brillouin zone, the Brillouin zone is gonna look like this. There's several high symmetry points which are invariant under inversion. There's the gamma x, y and m points. Now there's no reason for this since I don't have any phase here. There, the eigenvalues of a band induced from s orbitals, so say I put s orbitals here, the band can do all kinds of stuff, okay, energetically, but what's going to be universal about any band that comes from s orbitals put here, okay, with any type of hoppings, nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor, whatever form, is that it's going to have the following eigenvalues at the high symmetry points they're gonna mirror these eigenvalues of the S orbital that came here. The P orbital is going to have exactly its eigen, the same eigenvalues as, as in real space because there's no phase when you Fourier transform. Now the situation is remarkably different here. At this point, I can also put an S or a P orbital because this is also a Z2 symmetry group. It squares to one, so I can put an S and a P. But this guy is different from this group because it has a translation, right? If I take this, apply inversion, I go here. This is not the same as this point. Now I can use translation by lattice constant and I can go back here, okay? But this translation has a phase factor e to the i k x when I Fourier transform it. So now, bands that come from putting s orbitals here, no matter what their hoppings are, will have plus eigenvalues when k x is zero, but their eigenvalues will change from plus to, to minus because e to the i k x equals to pi is minus when they, at, at the m and x points, which are the pi points. Now, the p bands, the p orbital bands, do exactly the opposite. They're minus minus here and plus plus here. So, is this procedure clear? We can do it for any, for any you know, I can now put orbitals I can now put orbitals here or here, also S and P. They're the same as the group structure. They're the same symmetry group, but they have different translations. So these eigenvalues of the block states in the Brillouin zone will change, will change 
based on these phase factors here. So, what we've done here is we've created what is called um, all the eight atomic limits, or as Zach called them, elementary band representations. So, any atomic limit or any atomic insulator, any insulator that can be expressed in terms of local orbitals, has to be a linear combination of these eight atomic limits. And the eight atomic limits are SMP orbital here, 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 and here. Okay? So, what we're going to do is write down these eight atomic limits. Okay? This is called the 1A weak opposition, this is called the 1B, this is called the 1C, and this is called the 1D. Okay? But you don't need to remember that. In fact, it's better if you don't. And these are their eigenvalues in the, in the um, Brillouin zone. And they come from just doing, taking account of these phases. For example, uh, S at 1C, which is here, came with an e to the i k y. So it's going to have a minus 1 um, at the y equals pi point. You see here, etc. So is this procedure clear? We can get all the atomic limits or all the bases for the for the bands uh, for the bands that can be written down in terms of localized orbitals with inversion symmetry. And these are these bands. Okay, these are these limits. Now, what you notice here is that there's always an even number of minus ones or even number of plus ones. Hence, if I have a band with an odd number of minus ones, then I can never, like, say I have a band whose eigenvalues in the Brillouin zone, say I run a DFT calculation, and I have a band whose eigenvalues are in the Brillouin zone are these. Okay? Now, this has a, a single minus eigenvalue, so it's clear that there's no way I can combine these atomic limits, okay, which have an even number, to get an odd number of minus ones. So this band has to be topological, and in fact the number of negative eigenvalues, uh, um, even or odd, is a z2 topological index, which in this case is half of the Foucault index. Okay? So this is the Foucault without, without time reversal symmetry. So questions. So is it clear that now I can do two things. I can basically find all the atomic limits, and I can also find all the topological bands by finding all the bands that are not atomic limits, that you cannot describe as atomic limits. Is that clear? Questions? This went a bit fast, but it's important. Wow, no questions. Everything is clear. Okay. Okay, so we'll use this. So this can be generalized to any symmetry group. You can always find atomic limits by some mathematical procedure, and then you can find the topological bands um, um, by asking which bands cannot be written as sums of atomic limits. And these are, for example, this one, I'll ca I can never write it as sums of atomic limits. Yes? Uh, just class, so if I would have some different symmetry about conversion, I would be able to do the same thing. I don't think I understand the idea. But then this even number is not necessarily true for all. Yeah, it's not going to be even. It's gonna, it can be mod 8. It but can be mod is, 4. Whatever atomic limits I have, if I cannot write it as a proposition, exactly. That's right. So, so then, so once you have the atomic, the atomic uh, limits, you can ask, here's a band, can I write down some atomic limits? If I cannot, you can ask, here's another band, can I write down some atomic limits? And there's um, different ways that you cannot write them down in terms of atomic limits, and those are the topological indices. Yeah, okay? This one is like, that's a very nice well, well, this one is the simplest one that we can do by hand here. Okay? But, but it, you can do it in all cases, yes. Okay. Yes? Louder? Louder, louder. If I add more orbitals, it seems to me that all the combination of minus and ones are exhausted. If you add what? One more, or, more, more orbitals. Like, not just How many SMP. orbitals do you want to have on your lattice? Yeah, I don't know. More. I don't know. How many? <laughs> Define more. How many? No, I mean, I mean, I don't know. Let's say 10. 10, okay. Yeah, I would, like, all the combination on one and minus, I think, are like exhausted, so I would get the same atomic limit of coming from different uh, orbitals, right? No, so, so, so stay, let's say I take 10 s orbitals, okay? Then these 10 s orbitals would have 
I don't know what the band structure would be. The energetics no. cannot give you. But we have 10 plus eigenvalues here, 10 plus eigenvalues here, 10 plus eigenvalues here, 10 plus eigenvalues here. No, I meant like S, P, D. Okay, so let's take S, P. So just tell me a configuration. Like S orbital, P orbital, and D orbitals. Like for example. D doesn't exist. D is the same as S ah, under okay, inversion. That's, that's so there's only S and P. Okay, I, if I have C4 symmetry, D becomes its own standing orbital. But I just have inversion. And those are just S and P. D ah, okay, is the same as, as S with inversion. Yeah, okay, okay? Sorry, D sorry. is only differentiated from S by C4. Right? So basically, the, more, the moral of the story is that, that of course, there's actually even... So you, so you bring up a good point. Not all trivial insulators are the same also. Okay? So if I get a trivial insulator or an insulator that can be described as a linear combination of this, this might be different from another trivial insulator. For example, these two trivial insulators are very different. And this one. In other words, this one is S orbitals, this one is P orbitals. This, this, if I have this band below the Fermi level, right? There's no way I can get from this band to this band without having a phase transfer. So trivial insulators can also be different. Okay? And this tells you how different they are. Okay? Very good. More Hello. questions? Yes. yes. Uh, if you add spin to this, and uh, does it work for non-commensurate uh, spin or magnetic space groups? So or it works for magnetic sp uh, uh, space group for commensurate magnetic space groups. So there's a 1651, the 1651 magnetic groups. Okay, yeah. and those in the 1651 magnetic groups, there's about 30,000 atomic limits. So yeah. So but you know those are commensurate, right? The those mechanics. are commensurate. In commensurate, um, um, this you know you need some you need some symmetry eigenvalues. So in commensurate, if you don't have a, a um, yeah, in commensurate is I I this this doesn't fully work. Well, like the the spin texture, I guess, doesn't match the lattice structure, the lattice constant. So that's so then you don't have like time reversal times inversion as you'd have in a anti-ferromagnet. I guess this is what you mean, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. So in that case, in that case, you know, you're a bit the out of luck. Okay, but it's, uh, not it's not a periodic system exactly. So that's why you're a bit out of luck in that sense. Um, you know, you need to, yeah, but you need there, to. There yeah. are the, they're called spin space groups, right? Uh, so well, that's without spin orbit coupling. Oh, okay. I see. Right, so the spin space groups are without spin orbit coupling. So, so we haven't done anything on spin space groups because we, 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 we're basically just interested in, in commensurate for now, but that's a, that's a perfectly legitimate uh, research topic and very good. Uh, you know, like, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people interested in spin space groups now. Um, um, I, we, we just kind of missed that train. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how many? How many are there? You, how many uh, I is? don't know. <laughs> you see, that's that's how badly we missed the train. Uh, okay. Uh. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now we go to flat bands. So there's a very easy method, well, the very brilliant method of building flat bands that is actually, without particle hole symmetry on the lattice, is the only method of building flat bands in lattice systems, and this is Lieb's method. And these other things, like uh, line graph lattices, which, which uh, uh, you know, uh, the Kagome is a line graph lattice of a hexagonal lattice, are actually just Lieb's method also, with putting some potential on some sites and making them very large. So Lieb's method says the following. Take a lattice and assume I have two sublattices in this lattice. I have a sublattice L and a sublattice L prime, or L tilde. And these sub-lattices, he was thinking about a graph, but you can, of course, lattices are graphs with periodicity. So, um, so you can, if now the lattice L has more sites per unit cell than the lattice L tilde, okay, and there's only hopping between L and L tilde, then you're going to have an exact flat band at zero uh, energy. And the reason for this is very simple. The reason for this is that SK um, dagger is an 
NL tilde by NL matrix, okay? And this is a rectangular matrix. It's not a square matrix. So it's rank deficient. If this is smaller than this, you're always going to find a zero mode of this, okay? Because you have less constraints than, you know, so this is your, this is your zero mode, and you, you're always you're guaranteed to find it. And this is why this... Is this like saying that the, the large tablet is there's a group of... Uh, there's some uh, superposition of uh, orbitals that doesn't couple to anything? Exactly. The, so it's an atomic insulator in disguise. Ah, it's, it's, so, so it's not always an atomic insulator. That's the, that's the point. This is actually, most of these are actually uh, topological states. But you said no partial symmetry, right? But if you have so that's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. So, 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 you're, so the, one second, I'll come to your, uh, this doesn't have particle or chiral symmetry. Um, so, 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 yeah, so this is very important. So, it's actually, so your point is very good. So, basically, it sits on the L lattice, or the whole flat band sits on the L, on the larger yeah, lattice, the larger. on the larger one. But, but uh, it, doesn't, it, doesn't need to be, um, it doesn't need to be trivial. So, so the, you mean the flat band is not necessarily trivial? Th that's right. It's, it's actually naturally natural to be topological, and I'll show this in two slides. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly, that's a good point. Yeah, so this has chiral symmetry, okay? So it's got an operator, which is sigma z, which anti-commutes with h, okay? Sigma z in this uh, space, which anti-commutes uh, with, with, um, with h. Um, now, the, now, that's not particle hole, that's chiral symmetry, and any bipartite lattice with only hoppings between the two sides of the bipartite will have the symmetry if you put zero here, okay? If there's no hopping within the L tilde sublattice or within the L sublattice, okay? So this is why this method is a bit restricted, but you can immediately form a generalization of this method. So actually, the, f the full generalization is the following, okay? I don't have time to prove it, but, but it's very easy. This is nothing special, nothing um, um, super non-trivial. It turns out that it doesn't matter what hopping you put on the L, L tilde lattice. So I can put this B of K to be anything. So this would still have a flat, flat band, okay, which would be phi zero, which this is just the zero mode of this. Okay? This is just this, this mode. This is still a flat band. Okay? So now this is not chiral symmetry anymore. And it turns out you can still put even a matrix, a matrix here, A of K, as long as it satisfies some eigenvalue. So if A of K didn't satisfy some eigenvalue property, then this would be a Hamiltonian for any lattice. I could write it down irrespective of anything. But if A of K has a K-independent eigenvalue, so if this itself has a K-independent eigenvalue with some degeneracy NA, and if this NA is l degeneracy is larger than the number of orbitals in the L tilde lattice, you're still going to have flat bands. So you see, this is a concatenation procedure where you can build flat bands over flat bands in lattices. So, you know, I build a flat band and I put it, I put its Hamiltonian here, I, re I add more orbitals, so I can build lattices with 100 flat bands if I want to. Okay, so this is the fundamental, the generalized, it doesn't have chiral symmetry in the sense that the spectrum is not chirally symmetric now. There's no energy E to minus E, okay? Does this make sense? Do you believe me? As long as it fulfills this condition, as long as it fulfills this condition, I can put anything. So for example, for example, I can take, I can take, imagine that I have like a bipartite lattice, okay, where A of K is zero now, okay, and, and I find 10 flat bands. Then I take that bipartite lattice, couple it to another lattice, and I put that first bipartite lattice Hamiltonian to now be the AFK. It's got 10 eigenvalues which are, not, which are zero, and now I add more bipartite. So I can, concat I can basically just consecutively add lattices and build con constructively build many flat bands, as many as I want to. Yeah, so I can do, I can, you know, you can have flat bands with billions of orbitals if you want to, yes. Uh, just, so here the chiral symmetry is broken, but can this, uh, this understanding somehow also be uh, approached if we start from the index theorem? Because that kind of works for chiral symmetry, and that kind of 
yeah, so, so it can, uh, but I'm not very fond of index theorems because I don't understand them, first of all. But, <laughs> but, but second, of all, second of all, because uh, you know, I like to start from orbitals on real lattices. I'm fascinated more by, by, by uh, quantum chemistry than, than... But you can understand it from index theorems, etc. Basically, everything is... But, but everything is understandable from index theorems. The problem with index theorems, however, is that they're far less transparent than what I'm, I'm going to talk about and what I'm talking about. And they're not much more powerful. <laughs> in, in, other words, in other words, I don't know of any, of any system where you, can, where you can discover a topological state through an index theorem that you can't understand from eigenvalues if you add extra symmetry, for example. So, so, so yeah. Yes? Uh, gen generic. If you have particle hole symmetry, you can have other ways of doing it without Im without having bipartite. Okay. This construction still this construction still applies. Uh, this construction assumes some some sort of bipartite structure. And actually, what com what still stays from Lieb's construction, even though chiral symmetry is broken, is that that for example, the flat band still stays on the L sub lattice even with this. The flat band is still localized on the L sublet. So some, and it's still a zero mode of this guy. So some things from the Lieb, not a, well, it's not a zero mode. It's actually, a, it's actually eigenvalue A now. Okay, it's not, it's not eigenvalue zero. It's eigenvalue A. Once, once I add this, so you can shift the, you can shift. You don't need to have it at zero. And I'll show you an example. Um, um, sorry, I was, my mouth went, uh, and I woke up at four. So what was your initial question? <laughs> It works also without, with particle hole, but with particle hole you can have flat bands without having um, um, uh, having chiral symmetry, for example. Yeah. And the subnetters themselves, they don't have to be bipartite, right? Well, there should, you know, there should, there is a generalized bipartite structure because if you look at it, there cannot be any hopping between the L and L. The hopping between L and L has to have some, some constraint. So that picks some part of your, sub, of your lattice as a sub-lattice. And by that is a generalized bipartite construction. Does that make sense? It's not really, it's not the, the bipartite construction as we think of as like something, you know, just hopping from one side to the other and that's it. That's right, for example. Yes. So if, if I put A to zero, yes. and B to zero, oh, uh, I that's leap. That's leap. Right. Uh, will I necessarily get a zero eigenvalue for it? Is this the point that there must That's be right. That's right. That's right. So, uh, so that, uh, so the eigenvector that corresponds to that. Like this. Uh, well, like this. <laughs> so, so this, is, this, this is the SVD, right? Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. So, so, so one of the epsilon k alpha must be zero. That's the statement. Or, or, yeah, zero or in this, yeah, if a is zero, yeah, then. Then yeah, then yeah. Then that, that's the statement. Value. That's right. So, so that the eigenvector that corresponds to this eigenvalue, if I put an electron in that eigenvector, localized on one side in that eigenvector, it will never go anywhere, no? If it's one band. Okay? If it's one band if it's one band, mm -hmm. that's you've just restated the statement that there is no churn band that's flat from just a finite number of bands. So if you just have one flat band, mm -hmm. then you're certainly yeah, right. Th right, so if I just have one flat band, the only option I have to go topological is a churn band. But I know there's no flat churn band by the theorems that I quoted before. There's no flat churn yeah. band with a, f a finite number of bands. So that's going to be trivial, indeed. But the moment I go to two, I can have something non-trivial. Right? The moment I can go to, I have two vectors, which are zero, okay? So for example, like uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the Lieb lattice with spin, mm -hmm. okay? Or Before you said that you need an infinite number of bands to get a perfectly flat. Right, band. but but the, all these flat bands will be fragile topological. So fragile topological bands. So to, I, I said you need an infinite number of bands to get a stable topological band. Mm -hmm. ah. All these will be fragile. Ah, 
If, if they're exact flat bands, they have to be fragile on the lattice. Of course, as you know, in the continuum, that's not true. Yeah. But, but yeah, on the lattice, yeah. Okay, sure. Sure, yeah, perfect. So this, this uh, k-independent eigenvalue that you need in the, in the A block and its uh, eigenstate, are they also eigenvalues and eigenstates of the full Hamiltonian? Uh, yes, yes. So, well, well the, no, so the eigenvalue, the, 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 the eigenvalue of S of k, okay, with energy zero, will be the eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian with energy A, okay? So let's just not go through the algebra right now on the board, but it, the, the um, for example, this is the, this is the uh, eigenvalue, this is the eigenstate with energy A of the Hamiltonian, okay? That, that has a um, zero eigenvalue of S, of S. Yeah, okay, so, Let's go through some examples, okay? And for example, for the Lieb case, there's actually an, an index theorem that you have to have a, you have to have for this, you have to have a, a crossing here. But you can prove it without index theorem, actually. Okay, so that's the, that's the, okay, so Lieb's lattice is the following. I just have an S orbital here, okay? And an S orbital here. And I have two sites per unit cell in the L lat, sub lattice and one site per unit cell in the L lattice and I get this flat band with nearest neighbor hopping. Now, if you take Lieb's lattice and do a line graph, or you take the square lattice and do a line graph, you get to the checkerboard lattice, and the line graph gives you some prescription of taking the hoppings. For that prescription, you get this flat band here, right? So this, this statement that line graphs give you, topologic, uh, give, you, give you flat bands. But you can understand this statement from Lieb's, from the bipartite lattice. All you need to do is you put a huge potential on the S sites, okay? And you just integrate them out, okay? And then the Hamiltonian of just the, the induced hopping between the L sites from the S sites, so what I do, so I have just some hopping here, here, and I put a large potential here, and then kind of do second order perturbation theory and integrate out the blue sub lattice, and I get a checkerboard lattice, which is the line graph, and the Hamiltonian for the checkerboard lattice is this guy, Okay, and it's immediately obvious that I'll get a flat band because I had the original flat band in the place. So the line graph construction is no different than the bipartite construction, even though it appears differently in the literature. Okay? Okay, so now let's go to showing why flat bands are actually naturally topological, not in the case where there's just one of them, as Adi pointed out, but in this case where there's many. So, I, so here you have to remember that from a set of all the orbitals in the lattice, I can know the eigenvalues of the flat bands. Just this is the statement uh, that we had before. If I had all the orbitals, all the orbitals would be trivial. Okay, so now let's take the following example. This is some cooked up lattice um, with a flat band that's doubly generate. You can see it's got twofold. And it's not chiral. You can see obviously that the, you know, this is not equal to this. The flat band is not at zero, not chiral in energy. Okay. And the following things are obvious. The obvious thing is that if I look at the entire spectrum of these bands, okay, the eigenvalues of all these bands, I know them. They're just the orbitals on the L plus L tilde sublattice. Okay? So just by knowing the orbitals on the L and L tilde plus L tilde sublattice, uh, on the two sublattices, or the, all the orbitals in the system, I know all the set of eigenvalues at every high symmetry point. Does that make sense? Okay, now what's not trivial, and I don't, I don't have time to prove it now, but you can go through the proof, it, I think it requires about an hour, is the following thing. If you look at the dispersive bands, okay, here and here, okay, these dispersive bands here are singly generate, they have the same eigenvalues, okay? That's point number one. Point number two is, that one such dispersive band has the eigenvalues of the orbitals on the L tilde sublattice. So this is actually, eigenvalue-wise, is the dispersive band, the same 
Okay, so you can prove this thing. You can prove that one of this, one of these, has the eigenvalues of the orbitals on the L tilde sublattice. So this is an atomic limit by eigenvalues. So call it a band representation by by um, uh, Zach. Okay, so this is an atomic limit, and what you have is that this is the atomic limit of L tilde. This is the atomic limit of L tilde. Okay, and together. All of them, they form the atomic limit of L plus L tilde. So I have that L plus L tilde is equal, kind of in a, in a, you know, writing it down, I guess, the way our math friends would do it, to L tilde plus L tilde. These are atom this is the atomic limit, or the band representation of L plus, is equal to the atomic limit of L tilde plus, atomic, plus the flat band. But you see here I have two times the atomic limit of L tilde. So when I, do the, when I actually try to find the eigenvalues of the flat band, this is, are the eigenvalues of the orbitals on the L lattice minus those on the L tilde lattice. And this minus is the reason why, most, why it's natural to get topology. Okay? It's not always true, but it's natural, because it tells you that the flat band can naturally appear as a difference of atomic limits, not as a sum of atomic limits. And this is called the fragile topol topology. And basically, um, if, a, if I had a plus here, this would be trivial. But because it appears as a minus, okay, it's likely that you're going to get, at least for small numbers of orbitals, you're going to um, um, get topological bands. The one way you could not get topological bands for the people that know is that is if you could, <coughs> if the L sublattice actually contains, can be deformed to move it consistent with symmetries to the L tilde sublattice. Okay? But for example, for Lieb's case, it cannot be. So is it clear sort of, I mean, I just, this is just a, uh, uh, is it sort of clear why, why this has to be and not has to be, but it's, it's naturally topological, the flat band. Do we need to answer yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, questions, is, uh, questions is better. What is it? Plata or plomo? Yeah, you had a question? You cannot have strong topology on a lattice to be an exact flat band. That statement has not been proved. It's been proved for the term number, but it has not been proved in general, but I strongly believe it to be true. And, you know, unless you have a brilliant idea to prove it, you might go down the rabbit hole proving it. So, <laughs> so, so I wouldn't prove it. Uh, well, I, don't, uh, well I, I, I can't prove it, but, but it, it's, it's a certainly tr true statement. Yes? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I have a question about the thing of integrating out this band that you have shown before. So, that, uh, maybe I miss it, but doesn't, uh, if you want to integrate it out, don't you need also your band representation to be disconnectable? If what? If you want to integrate out uh, this band in, the, in some previous slides, don't you need uh, to have the possibility uh, to disconnect them from the rest? Yeah, so for example, I can disconnect them. So if I, can, if I take one of them out, Okay, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna remain with another one, right? So in in the previous one, when I took one of them out, right? Remember that here, this is L. This is L. If I integrate out L, this is L tilde. This is L tilde. If I integrate out L tilde, I lose only one of them. If I do the line graph, okay, I lose only one. This is dispersive. This is dispersive. If I integrate out L, if I integrate out one of them, I use. I lose only one of them. I don't lose both of them. Okay. So fra fragile still tells. If I lose one of them, this is still fragile. Okay. Because fragile plus uh, trivial can be trivial. Okay, and this possibility of disconnecting them doesn't, it's not like a, another condition, another. Uh, yeah. The possibility of disconnecting them like here, like having, or yeah. that's, I'll get to that next slide. Okay. So this, this, this um, equation also tells you when there's a touching point. Okay? okay. So the fact that you can naturally write them down as negative, this doesn't tell you that you can never write them down as positive, okay? Because this, this band representation on L could contain the band representation on L tilde, okay? So then you could write it down 
in as, as positive sum, but it tells you that is not, they naturally appear as negative, and, um, and hence, naturally, you're going to get topology. But that doesn't tell you that you're always going to get topology. More questions? Sorry, back, yeah. No. Yeah, here. Oh, do the math, like, oh. <laughs> so, uh, where do you see the difference between having one zero eigenvalue and having two? Uh, uh, um, in this, in... I mean, this SK, uh, matrix. Yeah, so it, uh, it's just here, right? It's just the, the size, it's size. If it's, if it's two... No, no, it, I understand what, what uh, determines whether you have one or two. Right. Right. But how do I see what, what in the procedure will fail uh, when you have one versus when you have two? Yeah, so, so when you have, I mean, most of the time when you have one, okay, so first of all, you need some spatial symmetry, right? Without spatial symmetry, you're not going to get fragile states, right? They don't exist without spatial symmetry. So, so all those eigenvalues require some spatial symmetry. So. That's not in here. This is just some. This is right. This is you, you, you're going to have to put your spatial symmetry into the S of K, and you're going to need to put. And then, so it's not obvious from just writing down this 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 Hamiltonian, right? You you really need to, you like. So it's not an obvious statement. This is my point. And you're going to need to basically. So you know this this band is comes from a two by four S of K, yeah. and there's a zero. Uh, eigenvalue. Well, they're like, there are some whatever. They're shifted, but there's some, so, some. There are zero eigenvalues of S of K, but they're shifted by by some A of K. Um, um, but then you need the spatial symmetry content to actually prove that they're fragile. So that's included in S of K, and that symmetry content, for example, does not exist in in. Um, so if I have if I have a single turn band, okay, what happens? It's it's either going to be gapless, okay? It's going to either be going to be connected. Um, uh, it's basically going to be connected to the other points. That's what that's what that's what happened. It, I can I can gap, for example, the Lieb lattice to make it churn, mm -hmm. but by introducing the appropriate gap, but then the band won't stay flat. Yeah. So all those are not th those are actually not easy. I don't know how to. Those would actually their proof would actually have to go probably to index theorems, but but but. This is much more easy because here you just have a you, here you're just counting the or you're just knowing the orbitals on the L and L tilde sublattices. You immediately know the eigenvalues of this band. So where did we see the spatial symmetry that you needed? That this that this that this, that this is equal to this. That the eigenvalues of this is e are equal to this, right? Or this is the one that you need in order to write this down, or what? That's this is this is the only thing that you need. You need, you need to prove that the eigenvalues of this dispersive band are equal to the eigenvalues of this dispersive band, mm -hmm. and they're equal to the atomic limits or the atomic orbitals on the L tilde. And that's a one-hour proof. That's not easy to see. Uh, but, it's but it's certainly true. Talking about one hour, I'm <laughs> talking for one hour. OK, very good. OK. OK. Yeah. Could you, so like. I mean, this is an example, right? But so the the general statement of this proof that takes one hour to understand is, I take any spaghetti band structure, there's I find a flat band, and then for some reason I know um, which kind of you know like this A block this corresponds to, and this is like how I find my, define my L and L tilde, and then and then it, and then you say like all and, the bands above and below must have the same representations. That's right. So, so if I have, so with, with the A tilde, if you concatenate lattices, it becomes a bit more complicated because there might be more bands above than below, actually. So then, but in the simplest case, so I don't have time to, to basically go to the most complicated case, right? But in the simplest case, where I just have, you know, where I just have this, so where I just have, forget about the A. If I have 0, S, S, dagger, and B, no matter what this B is, okay? In this simplest case, um, you have an immediate prescription of getting, of getting the eigenvalues of the flat band. And this is just look at the orbitals on the L lattice, 
look at the orbitals on the L tilde sublattice, subtract the eigenvalues of the orbitals on the L lattice, which, are, which can give you, by, by the, you know, you can just go to the Bilbao crystallographic server and find these eigenvalues, knowing the orbitals, subtract from them the ones on the L tilde sublattice, you find the eigenvalues of these bands, and it's natural because of the subtraction that they'll be topological, because they're not sums. Now, it could be that they're sums, and you, can, you need some more, more machinery to know when they're sums. They have to do with real space invariance, not with but indicators. But on the, in, on the Kagome lattice, the flat band is on top, right? So there's no... On there's the Kagome no lattice, setup. there's another... So let's get... And maybe this is a... This is a... Maybe this is a... This is a, a, a point... Uh, a stopping point for 10 minutes. On the Kagome lattice, the following thing happens. So the band is... Touches. Okay? So the band is not, not separate. The flat band is not separate from the other bands. Okay? This can characterize the touching also. How do you know do you have a touching? Well, for example, so here is the previous example. This is the lattice that we built on. This is, this is a flat band that doesn't touch any of the bands, right? But let's take this example, which is actually the Kagome plus the hexagonal. Okay, you can see the Kagome here, right? And you can see the hexagonal, okay? I put S orbitals on the 3F, which is the Kagome, Okay, and I put S orbitals on the hexagonal. This 2C means the hexagonal lattice, okay? So now I have five bands, okay? And if I try, so if I try to subtract, so this is AG is the S orbitals, so this guy, this guy here, AG at 3F induced in G, this is just, Zach talk for the band representation of the L lattice. Okay, that's this, that's this, that's this guy. That's this guy. A1 at 2C induced in G is Zach talk for the band representation on the L tilde lattice. Okay, you can see this one. Now, what you find if you do this is that there's a mismatch at the gamma point. So I cannot take the difference, okay? In order for, it, for me to, so this has, to, I, I sh if, I have, if I have a flat band that's completely separated from all the other bands, I should be able to take the difference in eigenvalues. It still doesn't tell me that the band is trivial. It tells me that it's actually most likely topological. But if it's separated from all other bands in energy space, there sh at every K point, I should be able to take the difference. Now here, if you take the difference, the, you get the following. At the K point, you get a well-defined, so you go to the Bilbao crystallographic server, and at every point, this atomic limit is given. You go to the Bilbao at every point, this atomic limit is given. You can take the difference. At the K point, you find the K1 representation. At the M point, you find the M3. But the gamma point, you find you cannot take the difference, because this guy has a gamma 5 representation, okay? And this guy, this, this guy has a gamma 4 representation. So there's no way to take the difference. So that means the band has a touching point. Does that make sense? So then, so you, then you've classified the touching points also. So by this procedure, you know if there's a touching point or not. Okay? So you see here, I'm perfectly able to take differences in eigenvalues. Okay? Still doesn't tell me that uh, you know, the band is trivial. In fact, this band is actually topological. But here, I'm not able to take differences in eigenvalues because I'm stuck. There's no such thing as a representation minus the other at a high symmetry point, right? It's either represent so if I was able to have a fully separated flat band, it would have to have the block state at gamma would have to have a clear representation. But this guy doesn't. It's a gamma 5 minus gamma 4, so then it must touch with another dispersive band. But I mean, if you want to know where it touches, I can stop after I calculate it or, and see that, like, what is it? Gamma plus, like, there's a two-dimensional representation, right? Uh, like even before, just like the third irrep. That's right. This this is a two, this is a two, minus a one dimensional. Okay. So this so it's the the flat band has to be has to have one dimensional representation. But but you cannot subtract from a gamma five representation a gamma four representation. There's no such meaning of subtracting representations. So then you know that it must have a touching point. It cannot be a standalone band. Okay. Does it make sense? Yeah. So this procedure gives you the way to 
basically just starting from the LNL tilde sublattices, any LNL tilde sublattices, know if there's a touching point, know if your band is topological, etc. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, I have to think about it anyway. Okay. Okay, more questions? Okay. Well, if there's no questions, maybe we take a break. Let's not uh, talk about the catalog. So you can apply those to 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 uh, to the high throughput uh, database and find the flat bands at the Fermi level. Now, you know, um, we'll see how useful those are experimentally. Hopefully they are, but maybe not. We'll see. Now, <coughs> what I wanted to do now is add interactions to the flat bands obtained. Um, in this way, or not obtained in this way, but just kind of uh, um, obtained by projection. So I can always make a band flat by just projecting into it. The downside of that is the fact that unless I have one of these, I, unless I, I make my flat band from one of these lattices, with notice I only put very short range hopping or short range hopping, when I project to a band, um, I'm going to introduce very long range hoppings, so infinite range hoppings. So, um, so this is this statement that we can basically, you know, if I have any Hamiltonian of some energy levels E n of k. Okay, I can do a spectral decomposition of this Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian matrix between orbitals alpha, beta at k is sum over the energy levels u and, f, uh, u and alpha at k, u n beta. These are the eigenfunctions of the energy E n on orbital beta star. And if I want to make a band flat or any set of band flats, I just take these energies, which can be, okay? And if there's a large gap here, I can just project into these bands. So I can just take my projector, my projection operator, and instead of summing over all energies, I sum over, I take, the, it's the same form, just summed, well, the same form as this, not with energy, just summed over the, bands of interest, okay? And this will create flat bands. The downside of this is it will introduce long range. Um, I mean, not, they don't have to be, they can still be exponential, the decaying, but you're gonna have hoppings between any of the sites of the lattice, okay? Which the previous models didn't have. But this, what we'll be talking about is valid for both the previous models and, and for this type of situation where, say I have, you know, Dispersive bands, a large separation, a large gap, and a manifold of sort of less dispersive bands, but still dispersive. And I kind of want to understand the interacting physics in these bands. If my interaction is larger than this bandwidth, but smaller than this, a good approximation, if the Fermi level is somewhere here, is to just project into these bands. So this is the projection operator, as I was saying. This is just this guy, projected onto the flat bands, okay? Or onto the bands that I want to make flat, again. So, I can work now, so if this is true, if my interaction, and we'll define what interaction I have, is larger than this bandwidth of whatever number of bands I want to project in, but smaller than the gap to all the other bands, then I can work in a Hilbert space that's restricted, that is just the orbitals, the projected orbitals, into the flat bands. And you see, I take the electron orbital, and C bar is the projected orbital electron operator into the, into the flat bands. This is an overcomplete basis, okay, because the flat bands only have however number of them, however number of them you have, say N1, 
um, projected, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call them flat because I'm, I'm gonna make them flat by projection. They don't need to initially start as flat or they can initially start as flat by the method we did before. Okay, so alpha goes from, but alpha here goes from, so there's only, for ev every k, there's only n1 operators for every k point, but um, alpha and beta go over the entire, because they're the number of orbitals, so this go from number of orbitals, which is larger than this, so this is an overcomplete basis. You could also work in the block basis of the band, which would be a gamma orbital, a uh, gamma creation operator, for example, which would be, this is from one to N1, to the number of bands I want to project, um, and this would be sum over alpha, U, N, alpha, um, C, uh, U, N, alpha at, at momentum K, C, K, alpha dagger, okay? This is a complete basis. This is an over-complete basis. You can work in both of them. Uh, there's advantages to both of them. Now, in this complete basis, operators at different, of different energy, i.e., this is the block band basis. This is the orbital, uh, initial orbital projected basis. This is the projected band basis. In this complete basis, these commute, anti-commute, Normally, in this overcomplete basis, they don't anti-commute, they anti-commute up to the projector. Okay? So you can work in either of these bases. Now I'm going to define a Hamiltonian that's very um, um, sp special. And this is not us who define the Hamiltonian, it's Sebastian Hubert, Pai Vitorma, and uh, Tov, uh, Tov, Mas Tov Masian. And um, so the Hamiltonian that they, they defined is very special. And we're going to go along this line of Hamiltonians to prove something about the, the spectrum of such Hamiltonians. Okay? So this Hamiltonian is very special, and it's the projected Z operator, so no spin orbit coupling so far. You can introduce U1 spin orbit coupling, and things still remain. Um, but this, as you see, is the projected spin Z operator on every orbital. So N is just the projected occupation number of orbital alpha at unit cell R of spin up minus S. So this is SZ. And you give a finite energy to this guy, which is U. Now this is a positive semi-definite Hamiltonian, meaning this is a square of something. This is... Um, um, this is positive. So this only has non-negative eigenvalues. So if I find a zero eigenstate of this Hamiltonian, I found a ground state. OK? So that's the power of this Hamiltonians. And these Hamiltonians also apply in twisted bilayer graphing for strong, strong coupling projection. That's how you can get in strong coupling when you fully neglect the kinetic energy. This is how you can get some of the ground states in twisted by the graphing of these Coulomb Hamiltonians. They're very different. They're not just SZ, but they're still positive semi-definite, as pointed out by um, Kang and Vafek in twisted by the graphing. Now, what we're interested in is the excitation spectrum, which was not found before. Now, if you expand this Hamiltonian, you can use the following property that N squared, so normally, if I didn't have the projection, squared is just zero or one. If it's squares, it's just the number n squared is equal to one. But because I have the projection, right, this is a bar, this is a project into the band, you get a projection operator here. If you do, if you solve this times the n of r, it's not just n squared, it's not just zero and one. Okay? But now you require the following thing, which is called the uniform pairing condition. So you not only have a very special Hamiltonian, you also require the uniform pairing condition, which is that this factor, does, which is the diagonal part of the projector into the bands where my Fermi level is that are well separated from all the other bands that are, and that are quasi-flat, and uh, this Hubbard U is larger than this bandwidth, but smaller than this gap, okay? You require that the diagonal part of this, okay, is, um, is the same for every orbital alpha. 
this is called uniform pairing conditions for you, things that we'll see. And if this, this is true, now you know what this is, because, because you know, if I take the trace, okay, then I have the number of orbitals here, okay, and the trace of this projector is just, this projector is one into the projected bands, and zero otherwise, so its trace is n flat, um, um, when I, so if I take the traces and flat, and this means, but if I take, if it's, if it's the same on every, on every site, then the trace is just epsilon times number of orbitals, so epsilon is n flat over the number of orbitals, and this is this guy. So if this is true, if this uniform pairing condition is true, then what you have is that suddenly this became the negative hubbard u model, okay? Because I square this, I square this, this becomes true. This is now just a projected number operator. So this is the number of all the particles in your projected band. The sum over all R and alpha, because this is, you get the, the epsilon factor, you can pull it out, okay? And now this is the number operator of, the, on, of orbital alpha at unit, at, on unit cell R, spin up, spin down, projected with a negative Hubbard U. Right, so now you're going to get superconductivity because it's a negative u Hubbard model. So, the moral of the story is this is positive semi-definite. If I know a zero energy of this guy, I know its ground state. But then I know the ground state of the negative u Hubbard model also for on this uniform pairing condition lattice. Okay. Now you can ask, isn't this how the, how how would I build this? Right, how do I build? Isn't this too, too restrictive? Well, it turns out there's a very easy way to build it, again, by symmetry. So, for example, if I have two... So, this, I have two sites per unit cell, each with spin up and down. So, spin up and down here, spin up and down here. No spin orbit coupling. Then, P A A, the projection to any set of bands, okay, any... So, this, so this is going to have four bands. Projection any two bands, four bands, which you can gap, any bands um, of, of the AA sublattice is equal to the projection to BB. Okay, why? Because there's a C6 symmetry that relates them. So this uniform pairing condition, in a lot of cases, can be just imposed, it just comes for free from symmetry. So it's not as restrictive as you might think. Now, it doesn't happen in twisted bilayer graphene. It's twisted bilayer graphene is very far from this condition, and there's consequences to that, the spectrum of those twisted bilayer graphing Hamilton is not exactly solvable, just the ground state is. And some excitations, you can obtain them um, um, analytically, uh, but, but, um, but um, there will be features that are different, and we'll get, hopefully, to that. Okay. So now, it turns out that this Hamiltonian, with a uniform pairing condition, um, has what's called an eta pairing symmetry, okay? And this eta pairing is just a Cooper pair. It's a charge two object. It's a Cooper pair in momentum, at total momentum zero, okay? It's not C.N. Young's, C.N. Young's uh, had a pi, okay? But C.N. Young's eta pairing, for people who uh, know about this, is valid when you have kinetic energy also. This Hamiltonian is just fully interacting, okay? And it's a local symmetry, it commutes Okay, it commutes with this, with the Z component of the spin, which is this guy. It commutes with this guy because it creates both a spin up and a spin down. So it commutes with it because this is a minus. Okay, so then um, it's a local symmetry of this Hamiltonian. Okay, it's a continue, and that means that you can enlarge the symmetry group to basically SU two. Okay, by this eta operator, and these are the SU2 operators, okay? And so far, this was still pointed out in the Hubert, uh, Torma, and um, uh, Tov Marcian paper. I think I mispronounced his name. But, so, now what you do is you take this eta operator, which is charge two operator, and you hit the vacuum with it, okay? And this is a state at particle you hit the vacuum with it n times, okay? So, and this is a particle 2n state. Or if you do it like this, okay, if you form a coherent superposition of, of many particle number states, then this is just the BCS 
ansatz. Okay? And now, it's very easy to prove that all of these are ground states. Why? Well, because, because as we said, um, this commutes with the Hamiltonian, so h eta dagger is equal to zero, so you can just transfer the Hamiltonian all the way down to the zero, okay, to the zero sector, to the, to the, to the vacuum, on the vacuum it gives you zero, these are zero eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, but the Hamiltonian is positive semi-definite, so these are ground states. So there's a huge, yes? If, if the alphas were orthogonal to one another, then it's obvious. If, that if, the ground states were in alpha, it, well, in al up is equal to n down, right? Because the, the brackets become zero. So, so the, the, uh, the, the, the non-trivial point here that the alphas are not orthogonal to one another? If the C alpha, you mean the C, C bar alpha, right, so C so here. If, if the alpha orbitals were orthogonal to one another, then if you look at this Hamiltonian, and clearly you get zero energy, either where both pins are empty or where both pins are full. Sorry, so uh, let's see, if, if these, if, if, uh, yeah, if just. One alpha, pick just one alpha. Okay. Then this, the, the uh, n up minus n down squared, is zero either if both n up, n, n up and n down are zero. Yes. Or if both of them are one. Right. And indeed, this is what BC has done. Either both are, are empty or both are full. Right. So, uh, so in that sense, you see it immediately. But n, n doesn't have, because uh, it's n bar, so it doesn't have eigenvalues zero or one. Right? n squared is not equal to n. n bar squared is not equal to n. OK, but, but, but still, they need to be equal to one. Yeah, if, yeah, so, yeah. So, so, so there must be, a, so there can be a superposition of both of them down or both of them up. Mm -hmm. uh, but the alphas are not also one to one another, right? Or they are? The different alphas. The different alphas. Um, the, some, some the different, uh, yeah, so this, this is, yeah, so C alpha, C beta is equal to P alpha beta at K of K, right? Yeah, so they're not all they're not, yeah, right. Uh, so this is probably what, uh, well, this is what makes things non-trivial. This is the only thing that makes things non-trivial. Yeah. Otherwise, I agree with you. It would be trivial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is this is the only thing that's that's non-trivial. So n alpha and n beta. Uh, and uh, the bars n n bars. N bar, yeah. Bar beta that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So basically, so you cannot write this down as a sum of commuting operators. This Hamiltonian. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. That's that's that's. So this is not. So normally, so. What I pointed out is, for example, in the Hubbard model, without any hopping, I can, it's a classical model, right? So I can just diagonalize, everything commutes. In this case, it's not true. No, so, but, but actually, if it's not true, then it's amazing that, then how do you get the zero eigenvalue? You have a sum of two squares, like in an harmonic oscillator. You have a sum of two squares which do not commute with one another. Then, <laughs> in order to get the zero eigenvalue, this one has to be zero and this one has to be zero. Right, but when you add matrices, it's not, uh, well, you have the sum of two squares and the off-diagonal term, okay? So, so the scattering, so the way you get the zero eigenvalue is that the Cooper pair in the Richardson, which I'll come to it, the Richardson criterion, the Cooper pair has maximal gap. It basically has the gap, yeah. of, uh, the, Cooper, the Cooper pair attraction has an eigenvalue which is twice the single particle attraction with a minus sign. Twice, twice the single particle gap with a minus sign. Yeah. This is the remarkable thing about these models. Yeah. So, but I mean, they're cooked, right? They're very, right. Okay, so. Okay, so now let's go to, let's go. So I'm going to now the complete basis. Okay, not the overcomplete basis. So this basis is is the, as I said, I, did, I erased it, I guess, the eigenstate, oper the operator that creates an electron in the block state, in the, well, in the energy state En, which now has been flattened, at momentum K of spin sigma, which in terms of the original electron operators is U, K, um, alpha, um, of the n 
of the n eigenstate, the eigenvector of the n eigenstate CK alpha sigma dagger. Okay. Okay. So you can take this Hamiltonian and do the following thing. So we know. Okay. So we know that all of these are ground states. Okay. We know all of these are ground states. So each each at state at at um, well, we don't know if there's a s on the only ground state. At particle number two times n, we know that this is a ground state of this, of this Hamiltonian. Of this Hamiltonian, <laughs> okay? Uh, we don't know that they're the only ground states, but we'll prove that, okay? And we want to find out the excitations. And the way to get the excitation is very simple. This one, the charge one excitation can be obtained by just taking one of the projected operator. So right now we flattened all the bands, all the, I have a, however many n flat I want, we flattened them, or you can do this in the flattened bands of the, of the previous um, hour. Okay, so we, fl yeah, sorry. These behave. Th these are these are these are canonical. These these are band operators. So th these are complete. These the so there's a difference between. So there's a difference between, C alpha, bar at momentum k, which is equal to some. So this is sum over alpha. Okay. So these are complete. In other words, if you have any indices here, they anti-commute okay. fully. This, this guy is the following. This is this guy. See, there's a projector here, whereas here is just one eigenstate. So basically, now you're writing against the unprojected. Now I'm going to uh, now this. These are the blocks. This, this, okay. this is the projected canonical operator. So I said there's two. There's two ways of doing it. One of one way is working this overcomplete basis, which basically tells you that the anti-commutation gives you the projector. So you know the non, non the non-triviality has to come from the projector, or where you work in the eigenstate basis, which has this operator. This is the operator that there are some other bands here. I diagonalize the Hamiltonian. I obtain these U's. I'm in introducing this guy. These are complete. Okay. Now, if I had worked with this from the very beginning, you wouldn't see where the non-triviality comes in yeah, from. Because yeah. the non-triviality is really kind of the fact that these don't commute. So, so the projection is useful to see non-triviality? This is still projected. Yeah, yeah, I, okay. I, like, I mean, that's the the overcomplete basis is yeah. useful to see the non-triviality. This is useful to do calculations. Okay. The projected is never useful to do calculations in an overcomplete basis. That's kind of a, or, yeah. or, or at least on a computer, it's certainly not useful to, to work on an overcomplete basis. But, but, but it's useful to get some insight because everything comes from the anti commutation not being satisfied, being satisfied up to the projector. Okay. Very good. Okay. So what you can do, so if you have something that, if you have something that the Hamiltonian, which is the projected SZ operator squared, which I can transform to the negative u Haber model, which is identical to the negative u Haber model, on the n state, which is eta dagger to the n, the n state is eta dagger, sorry, this n, uh, this n and this n are different. Let's do this. Let's do this. The two n state, the two n particle state, is eta to the n times the ground state. The Hamiltonian on the two n particle state, okay, here, is zero. This is a ground state of this Hamiltonian. And now, uh, shit, this is this is really bad. Uh, this n, this small n, is this two n. <laughs> okay, yeah. Factors of two caps or not caps, yeah. But what about uh, uh, the, the index of alpha? Uh, the index of alpha has disappeared now because I summed over it. In the, in the complete basis, it disappears. 
Right. This is. So, so this operator eta that you have there. Yes. It's a group of pair that's what? That's the sum of all alpha? Yeah, so the, the eta operator. Can you show its definition? Is the. Yeah, you sum of all alpha. That's right. So I can read. But particular superposition of uh, flavor. That's right. That's right. Of, of these projected operators, these projected over complete operators. I could rewrite this as a gamma. It would be some, uh, it would actually probably be easier. It's probably just gamma. I, I actually, I can write, anyways, but this is what it is. <laughs> That's right. Not in the, you know, alpha one minus alpha two. That's right. That's right. Only in the. That's right. So only in the sum over all alpha. Yeah. That's right. Very good. Okay. So if I have this, then now I can take the ansatz for the charge one excitation to be one of these operators, one the single particle operator in the flat bands of momentum k of the flat band m and spin sigma acting on this 2n, which was in the slightest small n, which is really bad, okay? Um, um, I can take this to be the, the ansatz for my one-body state, and then I can take the commutator with the Hamiltonian and ask what's happening. And normally, what, what would happen if you do this, you'd get, you'd get in, you know, realistic, in like a realistic Hamilton, is you get a, um, you'd get, you get a com If I take h, comma gamma dagger, I would get something like this, that's linear in gamma dagger, okay, plus something that's gamma dagger, gamma dagger, gamma, okay. I would get a, but here this term doesn't appear, okay. So you just get this, and this is also true for, it doesn't appear when you, uh, even when you, uh, even without hitting the ground state, but when you hit the ground state, it doesn't appear. and this is also true for twisted bilayer. This is kind of like, this is why for twisted bilayer graphene, even though they don't have this uniform pairing condition, you can get the charge one excitations exactly also for the projected Hamiltonians, okay? So this matrix describes the, what happened to these flat bands due to to interactions, and you find out that nothing happens. <laughs> so, so the charge one excitation of this Hamiltonian is actually flat at, 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 at energy. This was the uniform pairing. This was, this was. I remind you that one over the volume, sum over sum over sum over k, of the projection operator momentum k component alpha alpha, was this epsilon. This was the uniform pairing condition. Doesn't depend on alpha. And the pairing gap is this guy, okay? And this is Volovic's basically the result, right? This is the fact that the pairing gap in flat bands now is proportional to the interaction. So now you start wondering whether this thing is really kind of trivial, because, you know, I don't get, I just get, I just get the this state, the charge one excitation on top of my superconducting ground state has, has, has flat excitation, so the Cooper pair is flat. The Cooper pair, the Cooper, uh, sorry, the Bogolyubov quasi-particle is flat. So you start wondering whether it's trivial. And then you go to Cooper pair excitations. And now you do the same thing, except not with one operator, but with two operators. Okay, you want the charge two spectrum. And the charge two spectrum is now at momentum P. Okay, so I take an operator at minus K, at momentum, and then I take one at momentum K plus P, we're in two different, so this is the operator that creates me an electron momentum minus k in flat band n, operator that creates me an electron momentum p plus k in flat band m. This is, this n is not equal to this n, this is such nonsense. This, this n in the ket is always the two, the number of particles. Okay? Shows I wrote this uh, at 4 a.m. So, so, so this n here is not equal to this n. <laughs> it's just equal to the number of particles of my, I'm, I'm looking at the ground state of number of particle 
to n sector, okay? And I build a Cooper excitation on top of it. And then you find that it's again scatters in the Cooper pairs in the Cooper pair subspace with another scatter matrix. This is just kind of a generic, okay? But the fundamental of this scattering matrix R is that it contains two one-body excitations. So remember, the energy of one particle, so the energy of, of the energy of the function of the, of the Bogolubov quasi-particle was constant, right? I sh we showed. So the energy of the Bogolubov quasi-particle was epsilon u over 2. Now I have two of them, so there's no factor of two, right? This is, this, would, this is the particle particle continuum. There's a lot of them, okay? And a scattering matrix. Now, the scattering matrix has the following properties. For the spin triplet case, this guy is symmetric, and the fermions are anti symmetric. So the spin triplet Cooper pair has energy, flat energy, epsilon u. The scattering matrix is um, symmetric for spin triplet, but then the fermions are anti-symmetric. When you anti-symmetrize it, it becomes zero. So spin triplet Cooper pair does nothing. But you knew it does nothing because the eta pairing was spin singlet. Now, the interesting case is the spin singlet Cooper pair, which has the following property. You find by direct computation, that this is the scattering matrix. These are the U's. These U's are the eigenstates, okay? These U's are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. The math Cal U is just this combination. So U M alpha at K, okay? And is the eigenstate of the single particle Hamiltonian, a, a flat band M orbital alpha it's, it's weight on orbital alpha at momentum k. And you find out that this scattering matrix is just basically this math cal u dagger um, u, okay, where, um, where you see this is a huge matrix, right? Because this math cal u matrix, you see the matrix structure is k. k runs from one to number of, 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 uh, of, um, of uh, sites of unit cells. So this is a huge matrix. So this is the matrix construct contraction here is over alpha, which is the number of orbitals, right? So this is a huge matrix of momentum by momentum. But the fundamental thing about these matrices, whenever you see such a matrix, you immediately know there's something non-trivial because you immediately know this matrix has a huge number of zero modes, the scattering matrix. And the reason is the following. Whenever I have a matrix, That's the product of two matri of u and u dagger. Okay, so let's say my s is minus u over v. Well, this is minus hover u over v. Let's take minus. Okay, <laughs> math cal u, math cal u dagger, and this is a this is a huge matrix here times alpha, and this is alpha times a huge matrix, right? No, so that's the point. So you see, th this is how the indices work. This, this, is, this is an entire one index, yeah. and this is another, this is alpha is very small. Like exactly. So it's, so it's, right, so this is just the index. So it's, so basically this is uh, a huge matrix. This is like this, okay, this guy, and this is like this. The spectrum the number of non-zero eigenvalues of this guy is the same as the number of non-zero eigenvalues of this guy. This is, a fun, the, I don't know if it's the fundamental theorem of algebra, but everything leads to the fundamental theorem of algebra in some way. Um, okay? So the spectrum of this guy is the same as, usually this doesn't give you anything if these are squares, but in this case it gives you immediately the following fact. This guy is now, you dagger you, now it has become, this is this, and this is this. This is n orbital, 
this is alpha index. Now here, this was alpha and this was k, m, and n, and this was alpha and this was, this was k, m, and n, and you had a huge matrix here with many eigenvalues, okay, which you'd find it hopeless to diagonalize. But you immediately realize that this is, has the same non-zero eigenvalues as this matrix, which now has a number of orbitals times number of orbitals eigenvalues. This is finite. This scales as the length of the system, or this, and this is finite. So you know it's the only non-zero eigenvalues of the scattering matrix are the number of orbitals. That's the only uh, number of non-zero eigenvalues of the scattering matrix. And of course, because this minus sign is also negative semi-definite, so you know it involves Cooper pairing. This is a scattering matrix. This is what comes on top of the two-particle continuum. Okay, since it's negative, it basically will create a bound state, and this is the Cooper pair bound state. Okay, and this matrix S has a huge null space. The only non-negative, the only non-zero eigenvalues are n orbitals are n orbital eigenvalues, okay? And again, this is the statement that I've just made here. But this Hamiltonian is now the Hamiltonian that characterizes the Cooper pair. So the Cooper pair, the two-body excitation, you can also characterize this effectively by a single particle Hamiltonian, which is just a product of projectors now. Because you see, we had this math Cal U was eigenstate times eigenstate, this is kind of like one projector, and I have another projector here. So you basically, if you go through the math, it's just the Hamiltonian for the Cooper pair. This is the Cooper pair Hamilton, the collective mode Hamiltonian. It's just the product of two projectors of the single particle Hamiltonian. It can only have n orbital eigenvalues. Okay, so let's get an example. So this is how it looks for uh, one of the, one of the, one of the, actually, this is, this is a, this is one of the Lieb models, okay? Where, where the number of orbitals is actually uh, three in this case. Three or four, I don't remember, three. I'm not, I don't remember if it's default. No, this is this three, okay? So you get only three. So this, this guy, this, there's, a, there's a shitload of states here, okay? So because I have, I have the number of states that's here, I can count it, is number of unit cells in, in the system, which is this k, times number of flat bands, because this is this m index, times another number of flat bands, because this is this n index, right? Because I can have, this is the Cooper, this is the two particle operator, I can have gamma dagger, gamma dagger, each of them can have, um, can be in, in one of the flat bands or the other, okay? But I only have three, the scattering matrix is what pulls down the bound states, and I only have three negative, three non-zero eigenvalues of the scattering matrix. The zero eigenvalues of the scattering matrix still give you the same energy as just, like the full energy is just two of the unpaired of the Bogolubov quasi-particle because there's no, it doesn't do any bounding, and there's this many, this many bands in this continuum of unpaired states. This is basically just two quasi, two Bogolubov quasi particles, not scattering and just sitting there. And this, these are the Cooper pairs. Now, of course, you know here that the, that this has to be zero energy. Why do you know that this has to be zero energy? Well, we said that the state of two n particles, which is eta dagger at n times zero has to be a ground state. But I can go the state at two n plus one particles, okay, which is eta dagger at n plus one on zero also has to be a ground state, okay? And of the same energy zero. But this is what I'm doing here. I'm doing two n plus one particle, two n two times n plus one or two n plus two particles. So I know I must get at least one part of the spectrum that has zero energy and this is just this state. But now what we're interested in is the stiffness of this guy. Is this, is this, um, uh, this curvature, right? And this is the mass of the Cooper pair, okay? Okay, 
So I'm gonna. I, 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 can't, I can't prove this, but it's, a, it's again a one hour proof. What you can show is the following fact. What you can show is that the curvature, right, this is another model, but with the same type of thing. So you can show that the curvature just because, because you have a single particle Hamiltonian for these, these, for example, three modes here, okay? They have a single particle Hamiltonian, right? They, it's, very, it's a very small Hamiltonian for the collective modes even. And from this Hamiltonian, this is very easy to, to manipulate since it's a small Hamiltonian. What you can show is that the mass of the Cooper pair around here is This property, this, which this is called the quantum metric, okay? And let me give an example of quantum, what the quantum metric is, okay? So this is a fundamental geometric property of the bands, and it's the Cooper pair. It's basically the Cooper pair mass. So this is a, a geometric property of which band? Of the, the band original bands. The bands to which you project. That's right. The bands to which I to which we project. Of the of the of the original Hamiltonian of the original block Hamiltonian. Yes. Now, in terms of uh, parametric, uh, it has to have the unit of an inverse mass. So, so the units must uh, it must be determined by the parameters on an adjusted parameter. There's some there's a there's a, everything is proportional to a u. Uh, there's some u. Ah, no, some. Uh, you're worried about the units, right? Yeah. Uh, right, so this guy is this guy is the second derivative of momentum, ah, so this, uh, right? So yeah. yeah, yeah. So so it's u times this exactly. So 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 let's. That's right. So so let's 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 write down gij. So if I take the eigenstates of the original Hamiltonian at momentum k plus a small dk. Okay, and I want to compare it to the eigenstate n at momentum k. Okay, so if this was a trivial, ham this, these are all flat bands. If this was a trivial Hamiltonian, what would happen is they wouldn't, they wouldn't change in k. So this would be equal to this, and then actually the quantum metric turns out would be zero. But the way you define the quantum metrics is you try to find a, a description that tells you how far away this guy is from this guy. So what you usually do is you write 1 minus u or delta mn minus, this is the identity matrix, minus um at k plus dk. So each of these has an orbital index here, right? And when I do this, I mean u m star at k plus d k orbital index alpha u n k alpha sum over alpha okay u n at k squared okay so this tells me how far these states are if these are trivial states okay if this don't depend on k for example like like in a trivial insulator where everything is localized then this is the same as this, and this, was, this is 1, or identity, and minus this will be 0. So they're, they're 0 distance from each other because they don't change. But this guy is defined as this gij with indices mn, and this is just the trace of this guy over the indices mn. gij of mn, dki, the ith component of dk, dkj. So this is why it's called the quantum metric, okay? Because it looks like you're doing stuff. It looks like gr, right? Well, <laughs> it looks like some r, <laughs> okay? So this is the definition of the quantum metric. And, you know, you can expand this. And if you expand this, you get a derivative over k, like we were saying, or two derivatives, really. 
So, so that's so this and this this guy is the trace of this. Okay. So questions. And can you just do this numeric? Because sometimes you get, I mean, what a, don't you get a random face then at each point? This is the absolute value squared. Yeah, but of two different, uh, two different k, right? Or Right, but the random phase, right, if I just get a phase, the absolute value will kill it. Okay. Right? If I just get an overall phase of the wave function, the absolute value will kill it. So this is, you know, this is gauge invariant, if that's, what's, if that's what you're, you're, you're concerned about. Okay. So it's a gauge invariant. I mean, it, if, if you do a transformation on the M and N on the on the on the projected states, this will transform, but the this trace will not. This this is just this is just sum over m and n. This, okay. Okay. So. Uh, yes. Uh, if you have topology, you have quantum metric. You told that uh, if you have quantum metric, not necessarily you have topology. Exactly. How can you have quantum metric without topology? So if you have if you have topology, the quantum metric is bounded, like you said. But if you don't have, and it's actually the minimal quantum metric, and this is, this is uh, we can talk about the distinction if... if Minimize of the, the positions of the orbitals. So, so for example, so this is related to, to your question. Okay, so let's take the following example. Let's take the SSH chain that looks like this two sites per unit cell, okay? Put my unit cell zero to be here, okay? And this, call this distance A, okay? Now, this is a trivial system. It's localized, right? So this shouldn't have a Cooper pair mass. There should be no, super, no superconductor here because it's localized on the lattice, right? Even if I put interactions, I don't, I put just interactions on each, so this is spin up, spin down, right? So I put SZ here, SZ squared here, SZ squared here, but because it's dimerized only here, it should still be localized, so it shouldn't have a, okay. If you compute the quantum metric of this guy, you're gonna get something that's proportional to A, okay? So, you know, you can get fake quantum metrics that um, that are that that are not so. This is why this is the minimal quantum met metric. So now you start moving these orbitals around, and when a is equal to zero, the quantum metric becomes zero. Okay. Now contrast this with the following model of S and P orbitals on site. Okay. Okay. If I have S and P orbitals on site, actually this will give you a non-trivial quantum metric. Also, also also dimerized. This will give you a non-trivial quantum metric, and the minimal quantum matrix of this is, is, is non-zero. So basically, what you want is not to have a dimerized limit. So any, um, so I guess, okay, so I don't have a good, good example for your question, which is very good. Uh, well, it's not very good that I don't have a good example. The question is very good. <laughs> but, but basically, basically anything that will, that will, anything that will have your eigenstates change, will give you some quantum metric. Now the question is whether that's a minimal quantum metric or not. And then you have to, to so this is, the, this is the, the, new, the new thing. So this, there were statements in the literature that basically said that, that the quantum metric is important. It's actually the minimal quantum metric that's important because quantum metric is a property that depends on the position of the orbitals in the lattice. And then you must show that there's no position of the orbitals on the lattice for which the quantum metric is zero. If, it's, if there is such a position, then your quantum metric will be zero. So, so just having something here that, that changes, an eigenstate that changes, is not, is not good enough. So you must have um, um, a minimal quantum metric that's non-zero. So only some types of non-topological states will do that. For example, the, this SSH, this molecular states will not do this. This molecular states will just have zero quantum metric, zero minimal quantum metric, even though if you compute it by choosing some unit cell origin, it will show up as non-zero, it will show up proportional to this distance. Okay, so I don't have a good, a good example of a, of a, of a non-topological state that has a quantum metric, but, I mean, a good example that I can work out. 
But this is one of them. If the orbitals are at a maximal wick opposition, then you can, you can prove that the quantum metric is, the minimal quantum metric is computed when the orbitals are on the, on the maximal wick opposition. So that's kind of a theorem of how you define the minimal quantum metric. You take all the orbitals on your lattice, and while preserving the symmetry, you try to bring them to a maximal wick opposition. If on that maximal wick opposition, they still have quantum metric, then um, this is non-zero. The SSSA chain, when you bring them to the, to the maximal wick opposition, which you can do, which is here, its quantum metric becomes zero because this quantum metric is proportional to the distance. I don't have, I know it is not a satisfying answer, but it's, it's it, very good, thanks. Oh. <laughs> Uh, anything is enough. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, I think I think we're basically I think we're basically done since we don't I don't want since we don't want to go to Twisted Bailey. So maybe we just take more questions. So the the the, mo the moral of the story is that the the Cooper pair mass is given by the quantum metric topology bounds the quantum metric. But you don't need topology to get um, to get stiffness. So the Cooper pair, if the Cooper pair was flat, then this would be a completely unstable system. It could go into any other any other state, right? So the Cooper pair needs a mass. Okay. So so and that's the that's the that's that's the, the what what bounds the fluctuations, right, of the order parameter. So that's so and that's for flat bands. It's a quantum geometric quantity. For, and which you can prove exactly in this uniform pairing statements. Now, for twisted bilayer, that also applies, but you cannot prove it exactly, but, you know, it's because you don't have the uniform pairing condition. But, you know, it's, it's also, you can sort of hand-wavingly um, argue that it's, it, it's also true. Okay? So, maybe more questions. Are there more questions? Because then I still have five minutes, so I can keep you here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the, no, the, I, met, the, I mentioned the Richardson criterion. So the Richardson criterion for superconductivity. I think it's the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> Just two different papers. <laughs> um, no, so I think, so the guy... The guy was trying, I guess, to like look at uh, look at bound states in quarconium or whatever he was like something like that, right? So he was trying to get a, get a right. So he first did a model for quarconium for for like these, uh, which is basically the TS model that you can solve exactly. So the Richardson model is a model for superconductivity that's exactly solvable. Yeah. And Godin, they're actually called Godin Richardson, I guess, right? So or Richardson Godin, one of the two. Uh, and and um, and then he, he thought, so BCS, you know, these guys wanted to do the models by, I guess, well, I don't know what they wanted to do, but there's, anyways, this, the moral of the story is that BCS is a number non-conserving uh, 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 formalism, right? So it has a gap, etc. But if you want to diagonalize the Hamiltonian, right, normally we have Hamiltonians which are number conserving. So then you ask, well, how do I find superconductivity in my Hamiltonian? It's number conserving. The BCS is a single particle formalism, and you know its, it's wave function is a mean field wave function, etc. And it breaks particle number. But all the Hamiltonians that you level diagonalize are 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 single, are number conserving, unless yeah, actually all the Hamiltonians that you diagonalize in nature are number conserving. So then, how do you know you find superconductivity? Well, what you look is at the two particle bound state because you want a two particle bound state, and there will be the Cooper pair. So you have the ground state at n particles. You have the single particle excitation, okay, or n minus one. You can do this in either plus one or minus one sector. Let's do it plus, plus one. And hence, the gap, the energy difference for the single particle is en plus one minus en. And now you look at two particles, and you have the lowest energy in two particles. It's en plus two. En, right, en plus two. So now you ask, is this lower than the two particle, two single particle continuum. So if I had two single particles, 
if I had two single particles, so I, if I create two single particles, I would create two delta, which is 2 En plus 1 minus En. OK? And I'm a, I, what, I, what I ask is, is En plus 2 minus En, which is the difference from the, of the two particle excitation on top of the ground state at N particles, Okay, of the lowest state at n plus two minus the is this is this smaller than two delta? If it's smaller than two delta by a finite amount, then there's a bound state. Okay, and that this this is called the Richardson criterion of superconductivity. If this happens, then you have some pairing. So this this is what I was this is what what I was referring to. This is also true for more, this is how you search, this is how like for example in the, in the Cooper super, when they were diagonalizing, right, so there's this whole long-standing thing of whether the Hubbard model superconducts, right? Um, you know, so this is what they do, they search for the Richardson criterion. Of course, they, then they search also for, for correlations functions, right? But, but if, you, if, you, if you don't want to use wave functions, if you just have the spectrum, this is what you check first. Well, no, this is, these are many-body states. These are not, so you solve your, these are many-body levels. I'm not, this is not single particles, okay? What you, you have a huge Hamiltonian with a huge number of particles interacting. You solve your Hamiltonian by computer by picking a many-body basis. This is the ground state energy in the particle number n. This is the ground state energy in the particle number n plus one. The ground state energy in the particle number n plus two. You check this relation. These are all many-body energy levels, not single particle. Okay? But this tells you that it's, it's favorable to cause bound states. Okay? Well, in the BDG formalism, this would be... So in the BDG formalism, this would be the BDG quasi-particle. This would be the vacuum, the BCS vacuum. And this would be the Cooper pair. Okay, so this is kind of this is a criterion of how to check for superconductivity by kind of matching the number conserving formalism to the BCS. Very good. Okay. Oh, thank you. It's, it's just going to be two minutes. So happily or sadly, we reached the end. But uh, I have very good news. There will be another edition next year on linear and nonlinear topological responses on quantum matter. Uh, probably the same week of August. It's usually the third one. Or at least there is another week of August uh, after the school. And OK, we all agree that the lectures have been very good, and the lecturers were very clear. and. I thank all the lecturers again. But I also want to say that you were outstanding the students too. You make the school very interesting with all your questions. Uh, you participate a lot and you were very active. And, and we thank you all, the lecturers and the organizers, for having such a nice attitude. And I also wanted to say that if you have any comments or suggestions about how to improve the school, please let us know on Slack, on our email account. We are not going to make it less dense. <laughs> that is something. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we put all the videos and lectures online that you can after check it again and read it. But I, we believe that it's nice to have like uh, introduction to the field and then more tough lectures and uh, tougher lectures. But other than that, we are very happy to, to get your comments and suggestions. Thank you. So I think we owe a big thank you to our four organizers and to uh, Estelle who, who, who really made this uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, event. Thanks. <laughs>